Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. My name is Irene and I'm a registered dietitian and today I'm back with another pediatric nutrition case study, this time on the topic of milk protein allergy. As always, this case study is based on a variety of my experiences, but is 100% made up. So today's scenario is patient C is a two month old term girl admitted for vomiting, diarrhea, and poor weight gain for the past several weeks. Patient C's test results came back negative for all viral and bacterial acute illnesses. Mom reports that she's been breastfeeding patient exclusively since birth and patient's anthropometric measurements are 3.25 kilograms weight, 55 centimeters length, 30 38 centimeters head circumference. At birth, patient's anthropometric measurements were 2.5 kilos weight, 49 centimeters length, and 34 centimeters head circumference. So the first thing that I always look at when I'm assessing a patient is their anthropometric measurements. So we can glance at the growth chart to get like kind of a general idea of how she's doing growth wise. So if we look at her weight at birth, she was about three kilos. So probably around the 25th ish percentile. And for length, she she was 49, so that is roughly about the 50th percentile. And for her head circumference at birth, she was also roughly around the 50th percentile. Now, looking at her growth now, two months later, her head circumference is still about the 50th percentile at about 38 centimeters. Her length is also fallen a little bit at 55 centimeters. It's kind of hard to see on this growth chart exactly where it's at, but it's definitely below the 50th percentile and then her weight is actually what's most concerning so she only went from three kilos to 3.25 and she's definitely fallen off the growth curve and you can kind of see that when you're looking at PD tools so I plugged in all of her anthropometrics and so at birth she was roughly 50th percentile for head circumference and length but her weight was a little bit low you know it's still within the acceptable range her weight for length is also pretty acceptable as well but then at two months this is where you kind of see like things have declined so her head circumference is still good the length has fallen a little bit to 15th percentile but her weight is really just dropped like she hasn't gained that much weight since birth so her z-score for that and for the weight for length are both greater than negative three so that is pretty concerning and so what we really want to calculate is her weight gain since birth so for any infants really we're calculating weight gain per day because infants grow so fast that really that's the best metric obviously we don't calculate from one day to the next we usually take at least a week overall weight gain or sometimes more depending on what data points we have. So for her, we're gonna go from birth until two months. And so we can find this by finding the difference in weight gain. So take her current weight minus her previous weight or her birth weight in this case. And then you divide that by the number of days that these measurements have spanned. So in this example, I'm going to use 61 days. So if I take 3.25 minus three, that gives me 0.25 kilos. So I want to turn this into grams. So 250 grams. And we're saying that there's 61 days between these measurements. So that's going to give us weight gain of 4.1 grams per day since birth. Now let's compare this to the weight gain goals for her age. So this is a chart that I use at work and we have this in our hand. But basically these are extrapolated from the WHO growth curve. So at her age, you know, she's about two to three months. We would expect her weight gain to be 23 to 31 grams per day. So if we do some quick math, you know, four divided by 23, that's less than 25%. So she met less than 25% of her weight gain goals. And then also looking at the weight for length, we can see that she went from z-score of negative 0.56 to z-score of negative 3.94. So she crossed three z-scores. So based on both of these criteria, she meets severe malnutrition. So now moving Moving on to her intake history. So since she's exclusively breastfed, it's going to be a little bit harder to really discern whether or not she is getting enough. There's going to be a couple things that we want to find out from mom and that's like how often is mom breastfeeding? How long is she breastfeeding each time? Is she breastfeeding at night? And 
are there supplements that mom is giving or anything else that mom has noticed so let's say for example we go talk with mom and we find out that mom is breastfeeding every three hours and patient is taking 10 minutes on each breast mom is also reporting that she feeds at night and is giving one milliliter of d visal every day and then mom tells us that this vomiting kind of like happens around feeding times and like while patient is feeding or right after patient is feeding and the diarrhea has gone on since birth so at this point it kind of sounds like patient is being fed pretty adequately we don't know for sure though because mom is breastfeeding and so we don't know how much milk is being produced so at this point i would probably recommend to mom that while she and baby are in the hospital that mom pumps just so we can make sure that she is producing adequate supply i have seen in the past where babies are exclusively breastfed and they're having poor weight gain and it's really because mom's supply has dipped and so like she's maybe only pumping like five or ten mls each time and that is basically what baby is getting but she did not know because she didn't know what her supply was we'll want to assess whether or not her supply is adequate and in this case we'll say that it is let's say mom pumps and she gets like I don't know two to three ounces each time like every three hours so that would be pretty adequate in terms of quantity which if you calculate this out using an example of 16 ounces for example or 480 milliliters this would provide patient with approximately 99 kcals per kilogram per day and 148 milliliters per kilogram per day and this is really right where we estimate her needs to be so typically based on dri a baby girl's needs ages zero to three months is going to be around 95 to 105 kcals per kilogram per day and then fluid needs are going to be a minimum of 100 milliliters per kilogram per day based on holiday seeger now we find that infants often need 150 to 160 milliliters per kilogram per day to meet calorie needs so that's typically like if i'm dosing a regular term baby's needs I'm going to say that they'll need about 150 to 160 milliliters per kilogram per day formula or breast milk. Now, this is for like a regular healthy baby. Obviously, there are some babies that need a lot more or a lot less, but this is kind of just like based off of DRI needs. Like I don't have a good history yet of like what this patient typically takes at baseline. And kind of the reason why I say that we estimate or we approximate that this is how much baby is getting is because breast milk actually is very very different from mom to mom and some moms they produce very very calorically dense breast milk you know there are some people that say they can be up to 40 kcals per ounce some moms produce less dense breast milk it also depends on the age of the infant typically it's like moms that have younger babies have more dense breast milk than moms with older babies and it just like varies so much but we kind of like take the average of everything and we call it 20 kcals an ounce so that's kind of like what we're using to estimate needs we actually don't know exactly how much patients are getting on breast milk and that can sometimes be a little bit annoying for like the dietitian type a person but you know we kind of just do the best that we can <laughs> in these cases and then the other thing that i'm going to want to talk about with mom is that when i have patients presenting with these symptoms you know the vomiting the diarrhea sometimes it's like constipation or something like that and there's not really any any other reason as to why this patient would be having these symptoms I'm gonna ask a couple of other questions so does this patient have any bloody stools do they have eczema or any rashes these two things are huge indicators of cow's milk protein allergy however not every patient is going to present with all of these symptoms some patients will have bloody stools some patients will not have bloody stools and you kind of just have to trial and error it as a clinician and parents always hate that and I totally understand because you know you never want your kid to be the guinea pig but at the same time we just don't have adequate precise accurate testing for figuring out if a kiddo has a protein allergy so unfortunately most of the time it is a trial and error so we'll put them on an elemental formula and see if they do better see if these symptoms resolve even if kiddos like don't have traditionally the rash or the bloody stools I have still tried it with some of these infants and seen pretty good outcomes and results like kiddos like stop vomiting and stop having diarrhea and things like that unfortunately milk protein allergy is like one of those diagnoses that are purely based off of symptoms and so it's extremely difficult the good news is most kiddos will grow out of the allergy by about one to two years old so it's not something that like 
you know, you put them on this formula and then they have to avoid milk for their entire lives or something like that. A lot of them will grow out of it and then usually like go on to live very normal lives. It's like not a huge deal. It's just initially you'll see like a lot of poor weight gain and vomiting and things like that. So moving on to treatment of cow's milk protein allergy. So there used to be this school of thought that we had to climb the ladder, so to speak. And what that meant was if an infant is on a standard formula, we switch them to an extensively hydrolyzed formula, which basically is just the milk protein and then you break it down into peptide. And then if they don't tolerate that, then you switch them to an elemental formula where the protein content comes from lab made amino acids. And that's like you had to take these steps in order to get to the elemental formula. And that's kind of like a little bit more old fashioned now. More and more clinicians are just jumping straight to the elemental formula if a kiddo is suspected to have a milk protein allergy. And I don't have a very like specific reason for this other than you just like wouldn't want to make families and patients suffer more than they have to because a lot of times we do end up having to go to that elemental formula anyways with kiddos that have a milk protein allergy, even though extensively hydrolyzed formulas are considered hypoallergenic. Basically with an allergy, it's just your body sees this protein and it has an adverse reaction to it like it doesn't recognize it so the thought process for the extensively hydrolyzed formula is that the protein is broken down into these peptides your body shouldn't be able to recognize it as a milk protein or as something that's you know foreign however i still in practice see a lot of kiddos really not tolerate it and so it's just a lot to have parents you know have to take all these steps try all these formulas before we get to where we need to be. If a patient has like a milk protein allergy, especially if they have blood in the stool, we pretty much always just switch to the elemental formula. Like we don't even take the middle step anymore. Now, if we did not suspect it was a milk protein allergy, like we think that it's something else, we would probably, you know, just switch to an extensively hydrolyzed formula. This isn't to say that like extensively hydrolyzed formulas are useless. We have a ton of kids on them and they do very well on them. But if we think for sure, you know, this kid has a milk protein allergy, then I would just switch to the elemental formula because why waste everyone's time, you know? So the other thing about formula to note if a kiddo is suspected to have a milk protein allergy is that a soy formula or a goat's milk formula is not okay. These are contraindicated. And the reason being is the these proteins look pretty much the same as a cow's milk protein. And so the kiddo is likely going to have a lot of these same symptoms because the protein looks so similar. So I would never switch a kid that I think has a milk protein allergy to soy formula or goat's milk formula. I also don't like goat's milk formula. So now you may be wondering what we're actually gonna do with this kiddo because they're breastfed. So does that mean we have to switch them to formula? And the short answer is no, we don't have to. So if mom wants to continue breastfeeding, that is great. I love that for her because breast milk is just so good for babies. It has lots of great things that we haven't been able to replicate completely with infant formula. Not to say that infant formula is bad for infants because we totally have a very valid use case for it. You know, some moms aren't able to produce milk. Some moms, you know, don't have enough supply. And to have this alternative that is nutritionally complete, provides everything that the infant needs is amazing. So what mom can do instead if she wants to is she can eliminate dairy from her diet. So by eliminating dairy from mom's diet, she will also be eliminating cow's milk protein from her breast milk and then thus make it safe for a patient to consume. However, this process can take up to two weeks or sometimes even a little bit longer. So during this time when mom is eliminating dairy from her diet and it's still like that two to three weeks before we can be sure that the cow's milk protein has completely left her body, mom can still continue to breastfeed if she would like, but she could also, you know, try some elemental formula. It's really up to the parents. Some parents are like, let's do some formula in between until I can be sure that my breast milk does not have cow's milk protein anymore because we just kind of like want to see and make sure that this is what it is before mom, you know, makes this whole lifestyle change because for a lot of people, eliminating dairy can be a huge thing, especially if you eat it a lot. So some families want to just try the formula first to make sure that this is what it is. And some 
families also want to just continue breastfeeding and then they're okay with you know seeing the results a little bit later down the road and it's I kind of just leave that up to the family so in this case for example maybe mom wants to just go ahead and try formula to, so she can make sure while she's in the hospital that this is exactly what is going on so I'm going to recommend mom to try Neo-K infant 20 kcal an ounce Neo ad lib with the goal of about 16 to 17 ounces a day and so really you could have picked any elemental formula there's pure amino alpha amino infant elicare infant Neo-K infant so these are all elemental mental formulas. I personally just have a slight preference for Neocate Infant because it is made in a dairy-free facility, so there's no cross-contamination. I have asked the Abbott rep about Elicare as well. It is not made in a dairy-free facility. However, it is made on a different line from the other formulas, and they never like switch lines, so there shouldn't be any cross-contamination. I have found in some cases that some infants, when they get switched to Elicare Infant, they have an improvement, but but it's not like a complete elimination of the symptoms and I don't know what the reason is whether it's like little possibility of cross-contamination or if it's simply the formulation of the formulas but sometimes I will switch them to neo -Kate infant and then they'll do really well so that's kind of why I have that preference for neo -Kate specifically I don't like alpha amino infant because standard concentration does not actually mix to 20 kcals per ounce it actually mixes to 21 and I have reached out to the rep about this and never really got a clear answer and so because I don't actually know what my patients are getting on that formula I don't like to use it and then pure amino I feel like is just I don't know why we don't use it that often but I feel like I never have good results on that formula like so I just I don't touch that one either it's also harder to find so that's kind of my reason for picking this specific one some people have preferences for Elicare over others because Elicare is easier to find and so if access is a huge thing that is definitely Definitely something that I would take into consideration in recommending specific formulas but if we don't have that kind of problem I don't know you can pick whatever formula so for now patient is going to be on neo -K infant and then mom's going to eliminate dairy from her diet and then after two weeks she can resume breastfeeding again we're gonna continue with the 400 units of cholecalciferol every day to meet vitamin D needs and then lastly I would just want to make sure that we obtain daily weight so we can keep track of her growth and trend it to make sure that she is going in the correct direction before we discharge her. All right, so that pretty much wraps up the milk protein allergy case study. I feel like it's pretty common, especially in pediatric hospitals. So it's really important to know the signs and symptoms and also treatment options. And if you're looking for more dietetics content, I have a ton more on my channel. You can look for the dietetics playlist, but I hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please be sure to give it a like and subscribe and I'll see you next time. Bye.